This video is brought to you by Miniature Market. Thousands of board games, discounted prices, miniaturemarket.com. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Last week, as you guys know, I have a day job full-time as an engineer, and I do this basically part-time on my free time. And last week, I took off on a plane. Uh, I went from Phoenix all the way to Silicon Valley, San Jose, California for business. And while I was there, I had a chance to meet up uh, with Ted Ausbach from Bezier Games. I got to go to their headquarters there uh, and we set up a little interview. We talked about, you know, some of his background, uh, some of the, the popular series he's had, whether or not there's going to be more of those. And then also some games are about to come out and some even more on the horizon. So I hope you enjoy this. This is just a sit down interview at Bezier Games headquarters. So Ted, you uh, started Bezier Games, and you've been doing this for full time for some years, right? Yeah, for three years now. Three years. Was it yes. hard to make the jump from professional world to the gaming world? It was awesome. Uh, that, this is the best job I've ever had, really. Um, so, you know, loved my previous job in product management for software companies, but uh, this board game design slash publishing is fantastic. I love it. Okay, so you just mentioned something that is very interesting because a lot of people try to be both the publisher and the designer some of them even are crazy enough to try to be the graphic designer and 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 very few people can do all of those things well like ryan lockett comes to mind mm -hmm. he does everything yeah, it's great but even some people they, they come up with a game they design it and they figure i'm going to be the publisher for this and it happens a lot and they realize it's such a tough job so how have you been able to both be a designer but yet be a publisher as well and be a very good one at that well Thank you. Um, I think the, the publishing aspect it comes a lot from my experience um, both as in product management um, and controlling all the different facets you have of getting a product to market. Um, so uh, in software product management, whether I'm mean, back back in the day um, when I worked at Adobe, it was physical products. So we'd actually you know produce an actual CD in a box with a manual and that sort of thing. And uh, being in charge of that, you're actually looking at all the different things that have to go into that, whether it's you know not just the the engineers that are creating the software, which of course is, is, is its whole thing, but also the, the manual, the training materials, the, the graphics, and working with a lot of the people that are involved with producing that, and working with manufacturing, working with sales, uh, working with the marketing folks. Um, after it is in, in the market, then you're looking at sales reports, and you're, look, working with, you're looking at distributors, um, licensing with other companies and, uh, or other countries, and translations, and all of those things. And so that by itself, I mean, those the years that I spent in product management in software have been an amazing help to be able to do this in this company. Because if you're running your own company, you're going to need to do a lot of these things. And if you're producing a product like you do in the, the board game industry, uh, you are you know, you're touch, you're touching everything, everything from conception, you're working with designers and contracts all the way through to when the game is done and you're taking it to trade shows and, and showing, you know, of course in the software world, we went to trade shows, we had to do demos of software products. And um, it's really nice to be able to demo a board game that can't crash. <laughs> uh, so uh, I had my, the most awesome thing in product management, one of the best experiences I ever had was in 2001, um, in Macworld, uh, the OSX had just been announced by Apple six months before, and they were desperate to get publishers on board. Just crazy desperate to, to get publishers to support the, the new platform, because everyone's on OS 9 before that. And uh, Adobe you know, had publicly committed they were gonna go forward with that. And our the main guy who did demos, um, Lex, he left Adobe because he went on Survivor for season three of Survivor, which is very cool for him, but Adobe didn't have anyone right there um, to do their demos. So Adobe sent me to Macworld to be on stage with Steve Jobs to do demos of a bunch of the products. I could do Illustrator and InDesign, a uh, couple other products of this, not even alpha software. This is stuff that was cobbled together. There's masking tape and duct tape just to get the thing to run. And you know, if you click in the wrong place, everything's over, <laughs> that sort of thing. And I got to do that on stage and it was incredibly exciting. It all worked at that particular thing. But um, you know, it's that sort of experience where you're, you're presenting things like that and you have that tension in board games. I know things are going to work because, hey, you know, there's not not much can really go wrong in a board game, right. um, you know, with physical pieces and, and whatever when you're talking about, you know, how to use it and demonstrating it, um, as opposed to the software industry, where as, as you're familiar with, 
things just happen. You know, you, you plan as much as you can, but things can happen and uh, not having that stress, it's really nice. Yeah. Well, you, it sounds like you've been prepared for this in your earlier life, sort of. Yes, un unexpectedly. There certainly was never the goal. <laughs> I like, thought, you know, one day I'm going to run a board game publishing company and I'm going to design games and try and publish them. Um, but yeah, I, I think very, very few um, people tend to do both. And even I think some of the, the more successful small publishers I know, you know, for instance, uh, Travis over at Indie Boards and Cards, he's a designer as well. And I think he started his company, one of his first games was one that he designed. And, uh, you know, but since then he's been more successful publishing other people's games because clearly he has a knack for that. He's a knack for looking, seeing what's good, turning it into something great, and then getting out in the market and making it successful. And, you know, I think that's, you know, some people are skew one direction or the other. I still love designing games either way but I definitely feel very comfortable with the, the publishing aspect, even though it is a lot of work and it requires a, a different skill set. So I think I'm very fortunate to have that, that background that can apply that directly. If I didn't have that background, I don't think I would be a publisher at this point. I think I'd just be a game designer and that would be a you know part-time thing, not the full-time publishing. Right. So when you started publishing games, these were your designs and recently you've done some games that other people have designed. Is that is that weird for you? Do you like it better or worse or Um it's it's different. I've I've actually been doing that for a while. I think it's it's more noticeable because last year I published a game from Tom Lehman and another one from Freedom and Freeze. So people notice that more when they see the big names on there. Um, prior to that, I had done, I had published games from actually a, a friend of mine in the Bay Area. I'd published one of his um, Age of Steam expansions. Um, and then I had published uh, another friend of mine, um, the, the game Ultimate World Inquisition. That wasn't mine, that was someone else's, okay. and I worked with him on that. And uh, also Subdivision was not one. Um, sure. But those aren't, those, in each of those cases, those were designers who, it was their first game. So people hadn't heard of them before. Um, with with Tom, obviously, and uh, Freedom, and they've published lots of, you know, they've been published several, several times. So um, that's a little more noticeable. And, you know, I'm working with some other designers now going forward. I would say it's weird. Um, it's it's really nice, and uh, you know, for me, I take the the job of a publisher as being not just hey, let's get this to market and print, but you know, how can we make this the best possible game? You know, and whether that's you know, it's fantastic. You work with someone like Tom Lehman. Um, you know, I make fun of him. He's like, eh, I don't care, do what you want. No, whatever the opposite of that is, that's Tom. So he is so on top of things and. Just, I mean, he went through the rule book so many more times than I even did as a publisher, just making sure everything was exactly right and there was no ambiguities and, and that sort of thing. And um, with the rules and every single, and it's just, it's just great to work with uh, these folks who, you know, that's, they're so committed to doing such a great job. So I, I learned a lot from working with him on that. Um, you know, it's, it's a great experience. And as I work with other designers, it's been great. So it's cool. all good. That's cool. So some of the, the games that are the most popular are from what some people call sort of the Suburbia trilogy, loosely as, you know, Suburbia, sure. Subdivision, Castles. Are there going to be any more of these types of games? So, you know, where we've been actually thinking of it is uh, Subdivision is actually, while it's related to Suburbia in terms of theme, gameplay is very, very different. Right. Of course, it's a, it's a more of a puzzly sort of take it easy style type of game simultaneous play. Um, the way I was actually looking at it more uh, trilogy is that you've got your past, present, and future games, which is the past is castles, the present is suburbia, and the future is actually colony, which is actually a building game, even though it's not tile lane, but it's a building game in the, in the same sense. And uh, you know, at the end of the game, you can look and see kind of what you've built. You've created this thing that does a lot of stuff, but it's kind of cool on its own. And you can say, you know what, this is cool. I've created this. It has this cool functionality. It reminds me of something, which is neat. So now you just mentioned Colony. That's one of the games that you have coming out later in the year. I believe yes. it's going to be an Essen release. Yes. Tell us just a little bit more about that. I know some people may already know, but sure. just give them the sort of one minute elevator pitch. Yeah. So um, Colony works. Uh, it's 80 years after the apocalypse. You're rebuilding society and everyone's trying to, to get a colony done before anyone else. The best possible colony. You start with a set of cards that give you abilities. Each card lets you, have a, lets you do something every turn. But the really cool thing about it is um, there's dice in the game, but the dice are mainly used as resources. And those resources don't change once you, the die is set to a three. It's a three pretty much the rest of the game at that point. And you're using those resources to buy additional cards, which then either generate more resources or they generate other abilities for you um, and eventually get you victory points in order to win. And you're building what we tend to refer to as a tableau, which isn't the most common term, but it's kind of an engine building that, and that engine consists of cards. And some people have, I've been saying that, well, think of Dominion, it's a deck building game, but if you actually didn't have a deck you had to shuffle, if you had all those cards available all the time, that's kind of what you have here in a way. 
Um, so that's that's kind of what Colony is. That's cool. And then you've got another new game coming out in June-ish, mm -hmm. uh, sort of a follow-up or a sequel-ish to sort of Fauna, then Terra, and now America. And, yes, uh, yeah. So America is the follow-up to Terra, and um, you know I, I've taken basically Friedemann's engine that he developed for Fauna and Terra, uh, which is really cool. And you know it's kind of the neat you have these these giant oversized cards with full color images and each card is asking you three questions in america it's it's pretty straightforward it's asking you what year was something done what state and also what some sort of number about some sort of topic and what's really neat about america is it instead of like fauna which is all about animals terra which is more geography based america is pop culture food uh, it's inventions. There's a little bit of history in there too. Uh, it's entertainment. It's just a lot of fun things and it's all America centric in terms of things that were made here or popular in America or uh, things that Americans would know, but also things that people outside of America know about America. It's really interesting. Friedemann played that when we had the, one of the uh, final prototypes uh, at the gathering and he played for the first time against a couple Americans and he came in second. Well, he didn't come in first, but he came in second, uh, beating good. an American, which is pretty <laughs> awesome. Um, you know, because a lot of American culture, you know, gets disseminated abroad and it's really interesting to see people, you know, there, and Canadians did the same thing too. They beat Americans, which I think is really funny. Uh, and it's probably on the history and geography questions because I think we're notoriously bad at those. Yeah. Uh, but it, it covers all those things. It's it's kind of a, a very open, welcoming, non-punishing trivia type game. Yeah, I mean, I just got to have a chance to play it. And it you really did do a great job of cleaning up sort of the mechanism and streamlining and come up with some new ideas to make that engine even better. Uh, so Thanks. yeah, America's and and I think you and I were talking about this earlier tonight that uh, it really is you know it's in a genre where it's like those trivia pursuit people that like trivia pursuit are gonna like this game because it's yeah. real trivia, but yet the wits and wagers fans are still gonna like it too because you still don't not, don't need to know the answer to the question. Yeah, and I think you've got that that that's exactly right. The wits and wagers aspect of you don't have to know something. You can have a general idea about it, and that's gonna get you really close. That that's really what's gonna get you the most points. If you have a general idea about most things, you're probably gonna end up winning. If you just know exact things about a, a few items, well, that's probably not gonna end up having you win in the end. And unlike uh, Trivia Pursuit, yes, there's some trivia questions, but it's all encased in a really nice Euro-friendly game mechanic so that everything actually feels very gamey. And it, it just, it's much more welcoming, I think, to even non-gamers as well as gamers uh, that are playing. So it's got that, that aspect, but it also has kind of the fun trivia stuff. Um, and it's it's a little more accessible in terms of the the content than the wits and wager stuff, which is a little more obscure. That right. Way. All right. So in the in the werewolf ultimate werewolf one night ultimate werewolf uh, genre, there's been plenty of games that have come out. Most recently, the one night ultimate werewolf, then Daybreak, uh, then one night ultimate vampire. What's the future? Is there a future for the series? Is it going to continue to going go on it's or what? Definitely going to continue. There will there'll be another one coming out later this year. It's it's pretty exciting. Uh, the other thing I can share right now is, uh, of course, it'll be One Night Ultimate something, but it'll also have a farm, a farm animal. So <laughs> I'll let you, you know, that's that's what I can give you at this point. Do, um, do we get to vote on which farm animal you it is? Don't, you don't. You're just going to be surprised what's there. And, you know, I mean, some people don't like certain farm animals, and I'm going to might disappoint them, but it's uh, uh, that's that's one of the things that's it's a lot of fun. I think this, this uh, takes the series in a slightly different, different direction, but also returns it to its roots in some ways. So, and uh, I'm not gonna say anything else, but it's, okay. I am very excited about it. People who are testing it are all, you know, uh, Vampire kind of gave it that extra layer of a little extra complexity to, to really, you know, just ramp up though. Gee, I really don't know what's going on here about the marks and the cards and things like this. This takes it back a little bit more to its core, but at the same time, gives it a jolt of energy in a way that I think people are not expecting. So I'm, I'm incredibly excited about it, but it's still a little ways off to be able said, to discuss it. You said it later this year. Is it, is it going to come out this year? Uh, we'll probably announce and maybe do a Kickstarter for it sometime this year. We don't know exactly when we're going to artwork and finalize the testing and get all those things right. done. Right. Now, I just saw in your driveway, you have a truck with a humongous one night ultimate wear of graphic wrap all yeah. over it. I mean, it is the coolest looking thing I've ever seen. Do you ever get stopped in that thing and gawkers? <laughs> we get stopped, yes. Uh, don't get stopped on the street, which is good. But if we stop at a light, people stare. And that's really funny. And I'm used to it now because I've been driving the truck for about a year and a half. 
Uh, but initially when I got it, it was a little little odd because people will just stare and they feel like they're staring at you, but there, I, I know there's a werewolf on the door right under where I'm sitting. So they're not staring at me, they're staring at this werewolf who is, you know, kind of a mean looking werewolf underneath there. And they're wondering why in the world is a werewolf on there? And of course it does say one night, it says Bezier Games on the back and there's a vampire on the hood, which is kind of funny. Um, but uh, yeah, and then, of course we when I park in parking lots, people people a lot of times people ask what it is, and um, you know, people take pictures all the time. We just see them just going by, taking pictures of the truck, which is kind of funny. Do you carry boxes of it in your car so you can sell it when they you know, come up and I ask you? I don't. We've, we've <laughs> talked about like we should have some sort of moving thing that we pop the back of the thing, speakers come up, and it says, "Everyone, close your eyes," <laughs> um, which is probably a problem while you're driving. We probably don't want to do that. But uh, no, we don't. We don't actually carry the stuff with us. For that purpose, um, normally. I mean, of course, we went like we just went to the trade show, um, the Kublikan um, game the show convention in Berlin game, and so we drove up there, which is kind of cool. It's right by San Francisco, so it's you know a little over an hour drive up there, and uh, you know we parked there in front of a bunch of gamers, and they all see that and they think that's really cool. So that's nice. Well, Ted, I'd like to thank you for sitting down with me and having me to Bezier Games headquarters. Yeah, you're more than welcome. It was, great San Jose, you here. And it was just a blast to be here to try out some of your new games to get some sneak peeks at some things that are come, that's come out later. So thank you so much for having me. You're more than welcome. Thank you. Well, I hope you really enjoyed that to get that inside look uh, to both Ted's life and how he runs Bezier Games and the certain things that are maybe coming out, maybe not in the future and gave you a little bit of ideas of what to get excited about. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I'm back in Phoenix now in the hot, hot desert where it's already 115 degrees because it is June. But we'll see you next time, folks. This video was sponsored by Miniature Market's Review Corner. The Review Corner features podcasts, video, and written game reviews by gamers for gamers. Miniature Market, the online gaming superstore. Thousands of board games, discounted prices. Check them out at miniaturemarket.com. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for backing me on Kickstarter and making this season become a reality. I'd like to especially thank those here that have backed me at the credit level. Now, these video reviews are also available by audio on our podcast. It's the intros and the final thoughts on GameboyGeek.com. Click podcast.